one down here, it might be two. There's a tail sticking out, about four or five foot down in the water, but it's right underneath this rock. It did move, as I came past, it did sort of shuffle further in though. But you understand, the problem is, I just have the tail, a little bit of tail sticking out. So hold the tail, grab tight. Okay, okay. Okay, so okay. grab tight, and then in the net. Okay, I'm worried it might double around and have a go at me. It is a tough and robust animal, so I need to get a firm grip for its safety and mine. This isn't a monster I can catch on the end of a line. I've got to use my hands. Hanzaki, better known as the giant Japanese salamander, one of the largest salamanders in the world, and the creature that I believe is behind the Kappa legend. They get bigger than this, but wow, this creature is aggressive, even though we mean it no harm. The good thing is that these guys, unlike fish, are just as at home on land as they are in the water. Pretty soon, he calms down. That is a Hanzaki noodled. And I'm very pleased, even with my gloves on, my hands stayed away from that mouth. Uh, he wasn't too amused by the fact that he was just pulled out of his hole like that. But this, I think, is the creature I've been after. Looks a bit like a fish, but it's got hands. And that's exactly what this has got. Mr. Toshimoto is monitoring the health of the Hanzaki population along this river. Four, it's nearly 10 pounds. Measuring, weighing, and micro-tagging every one of his catches. Counting all the digits, all normal. So that when he recaptures them, he can build up a clear picture of how this incredibly rare animal is faring in the wild. Best part of a yard long. And now we have collected a new one for his study. This is an animal that hasn't been caught before. It doesn't have a chip in it. So that's a really good capture. Normally, I wouldn't be allowed to touch this, but the fact that I'm acting as uh, Mr. Toshimoto's assistant means that I'm able to work with this animal. There are only a few pockets of these endangered giant salamanders left in the wild, these creatures that haven't changed since the age of the dinosaurs. Their survival is an important part of Japan's natural heritage. And when I try to release it, this national treasure still makes one last attempt to bite me before disappearing, unfazed by his capture. I'm in the Amazon, wondering if anacondas really can grow to man-eating proportions, and could they be responsible for a clutch of mystery disappearances? I've got a 12-foot anaconda cornered on a soccer field, and I'm trying to catch it with my bare hands. Right. I've got it. I possibly need to grab it a little bit closer to the head. And what I want to avoid it doing is getting its body around my arm, because if that happens, uh, what can happen, it can actually restrict the blood flow, and uh, my hand will eventually go numb and then let go. I can see the teeth on the mouth. They're like the barbs on a fish hook. They're pointing backwards. Basically, if that bites you, it's going to be very hard to get that off. It keeps trying to throw a coil around my body. Its instinctive follow-up to this is squeezing the victim to death. It's a struggle to stop it from wrapping around me. I can feel my arm start to weaken, so before the anaconda gets the better of me, I drop it in a transport container. taken far away from here and released into the jungle. Something just got me, something just got me. I don't know what that was. I think that could have been a catfish spine or something. With the net freed from snags, it's time to haul it in and find out what we've caught. Okay. 
there's a huge variety of fish, but only one of them interests me. This is something different. This is something different. This is the fish, they tell me, that's been biting people here. Behind its harmless appearance, this pint-sized animal packs some vicious weaponry. This is not a fish to be trifled with. Just being very careful here, just hoping it doesn't move suddenly. But I can see very clearly now those mouth parts. Now that I've got one, I want to test its bite. Oh! That was a very graphic demonstration. That's almost cut that fish in half. It's actually gone through the backbone. This fish has a piranha-like ability to slice off bits of flesh in the blink of an eye. And looking at that, that triangular wound, I'm left in no doubt that if any part of me were to touch those jaws, it would just slice clean through. I get my first real sight of the harshness of life in this place when we stop in a village to refuel. Life here is cruel and unforgiving. Just to survive takes incredible strength, spirit and resilience. Ah. Oh, messy. What's slightly disturbing about this fish is that it's still alive. Catfish tend to stay alive for a long time out of water. And if you let yourself be ruled by sentiment, you'd say, really, you should bash this fish on the head, put it out of its misery. But if you do that, it's going to go bad very quickly and the meat's going to go rotten and people aren't going to eat it. So basically, if you live somewhere like this, sentiment goes out the window and, you know, you want to keep this thing alive for as long as possible so that it's, it tastes good when you eat it. Simple as that. With their scaleless bodies and whisker-like tentacles, catfish are incredibly diverse. There are an estimated 3,000 different species inhabiting every continent except Antarctica. I have caught them in the New World and the Old. But here, the Congo is home to over 200 different types. That's nearly three times as many as in all the rivers in North America. This is an electric catfish. Yes, ah, but, the, but here? Ah. OK, OK. <laughs> it's got very sharp spines here. Ah. <laughs> 